Welcome to the stage, Dr. Azar Rana of Mountain Valley and our esteemed panel. Thank you very much. Please take seats. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for the second panel discussion on the potential use of psychedelics uh, for mental health. Uh, very happy to be here today with this uh, great expert panel. I'll introduce them in a second. Just to recap, yesterday uh, we discussed a little bit about the history of psychedelics and where, how we got to where we are today. Uh, we looked at some very interesting data on the paradigm shift of care in mental health uh, that Dr. Yehuda presented. We heard about some very exciting policy changes that are on the horizon that I think everybody should be very excited about and happy about. Uh, and then finally we heard some very powerful personal stories on the intersection of functional mushrooms and psychedelic mushrooms. So today we're gonna to tackle things a little bit differently. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we ensure that those people who need access to these treatments can get them and some of the work that's being done to advocate for those. So I'm gonna actually start the conversation not on treatment. We're gonna talk <coughs> about general mental health. And I'd love to introduce uh, Sebastian Younger, who's a world-renowned uh, journalist and a best-selling author. Sebastian has a very unique perspective on mental health uh, and trauma, having been uh, and having covered some of the worst wars uh, in the world uh, that we know today. Sebastian, so we've talked a little bit about um, the importance of community. Yeah, we've talked about how community is important, not just for the psychedelic area, but also for mental health generally. Uh, and you made a really interesting comment to me about the erosion of community and some of the challenges that that raises to to manage mental health. So talk to me about that. What's, what's eroding our sense of community? Yeah, I mean, understand, like, from the anthropological perspective, we're, we are social primates. Right. Uh, we survive only in groups. Alone in nature, we die almost immediately. And so alienation from others is a mortal threat and is very hard on our psyches. So when I was with American soldiers in Afghanistan, we were in a very tough place. We were in combat almost every day very isolated, it was br pretty brutal, you know, a little outpost called Restrepo. And when, when these guys got back, what, one of the things that was so strange was that after some weeks, they all missed it. Not mm. all, but most of them missed it. They wanted to go back to Restrepo, mm. right? And uh, at first I thought, wow, they, they're really messed up psychologically. Like that, they gotta be, that, that's real trauma. And then I realized, no, it makes total sense. Like they experienced basically our evolutionary past in a platoon. A uh, small group fighting for survival. They come back to this society, and affluence is associated. Affluence in the society is associated with higher levels of depression and anxiety, not lower. The poorer the society, in some senses, the better the levels of mental health. So these guys are coming back, and they're struggling because they're not in a community. Right. And so one of the things I would say: we're wired to survive trauma. Um, it can't be otherwise. The species wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have survived otherwise. But we're not wired to survive trauma by ourselves. And they've done experiments with mice, traumatize a mouse, put the mouse in isolation in a cage, it never recovers. Put it back with other mice, it recovers. We are basically mice by ourselves in a cage. Um, and that, and it affects everybody right. uh, uh, in this society. I, and, and I think, the, and I'll end with this, I think the proof is that most soldiers do not experience combat. Most soldiers do not fire their rifle, right? But an enormous number of those soldiers struggle when they come home. And you, you know, I, I think one of the problems is that the only diagnostic code is PTSD. If you had a diagnostic code that involved just a transition difficulty going from a communal environment to a non-communal one, you might actually get at more of the specific problems that these people face. Thank you very much. So this loss of community that uh, our vets are facing, and we'll, we'll talk a little more with Jesse about that, but just generally the loss of community that we're facing in society today, what's driving that? What are some of the things that lead to that? Well, I mean, the, the more affluent the society, the less you need other people mm -hmm. to survive. So modern mechanized industrial society has figured out how to solve the survival pro daily survival problems that, you know, until some hundred years ago were a constant struggle. And so, you know, I grew up in a suburb of Boston and I, you know, we didn't need any of the people in the houses around us to survive. We, you know, I don't know who grows my food. I don't know who built my house. Like, and most of us don't. Mm -hmm. So 
it's a, it's a mercantile economy. We don't know most of the people that we depend on for our survival. Um, so I, it, that's just the downside of living in this amazing society. I, you know, I, on top of that, social media, I think, has completely destroyed what's left of face-to-face -face community feeling. Community, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, I was just at a conference about social media, and the effect is, I mean, it's essentially an epidemic. Uh, and I think it's extremely dangerous. It makes every mental health issue even worse. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Great to have you yeah. on the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, moving to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Sarah Abedi. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Sarah is a emergency medicine physician and a psychedelic clinical research scientist uh, based out of California. Um, you're doing some fascinating work. Um, we've heard about your work with MDD, end of life patients, and also addiction. Um, tell us a little bit about that to start off, please. Yes, so I am part of the Pacific Neuroscience Unit and research in psychedelics. And we're part of the phase two uh, clinical trial looking at psilocybin and depression. We are also launching the West Los Angeles Psychedelic Research Center looking at MDMA for PTSD. And we have a lot of research colleagues that are helping us. So Johns Hopkins, NYU, Imperial College of London, Mount Sinai, UCSF, they're all doing incredible work right now in the field of psychedelics. And I may just touch a little bit on some of the work Please. that we're doing. We're noticing that these psychedelic compounds help us access a part of ourselves, that part of us, the stories we tell ourselves. And we find that sometimes that part, maybe we call it the ego, it can go into this hypercritical overdrive, this intense rumination, these automatic thoughts, these negative thoughts. And we're noticing that psychedelics can help somewhat dissolve parts of that ego and allow us to have a more macroscopic view of the internal climate and see things in a, in a different light. For example, if you could imagine an astronaut having lived on Earth, but zooming out and looking at Earth from the galaxy, just from outer space, and just having a different perspective. And you know, some of the research that is exciting to me is we're seeing you know, psilocybin show similar treatment efficacy as our traditional SSRIs. Right. Those treatments, you, know, you have to be on them for long periods of time, you know, four to six weeks sometimes to even get benefit. They don't help many people you know, have that more long-term deep healing. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more of um, a numbing or a, a suppression of symptoms. Whereas we're seeing one or two doses of psilocybin can have deep and long-lasting impacts and healing. We're also seeing MDMA for PTSD allow us to process some of that trauma that can actually feel pretty re-traumatizing if it comes up in a therapeutic container that is not supported. And so just to touch that this medicine, it's not just the psychedelics, it's that therapy component of it. That therapeutic container is everything. And we're seeing a lot of promising results. Fantastic, thank yeah. you very much. So maybe we're looking at the true antidepressants at some point. Yes. Right. Yes. There you go, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Jesse Gould, thank you very much for joining us as well. So Jesse um, has done a lot of work with an organization as the founder and president, uh, Heroic Hearts Project. Uh, it's a great organization that's been a game changer for our vets, giving them access and help and support in dealing with some of their mental health issues. Tell us a little bit about your work, Jesse, what you're struggling with and what challenges our vets face. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks so much for, for all of this. For the past five, five and a half years, we've been on the front line of veteran suicide crisis, the mental health crisis. For those that are not familiar, there's a record number of veterans that have been uh, committing suicide on, on a yearly basis. Despite billions and billions of dollars, the government has not been able to address it at all. And so I think that just shows, and, and veterans in a lot of ways are bellwethers for the rest of society of what they're facing. I think you can kind of extrapolate to the rest um, of the population. Uh, and it's just showing that our current mental health structures are just not working. And the current mental health structures are treating mental health issues almost like a physical issue. You have a broken bone, you go into the doctor, they have this protocol, you fix it. You have depression, that's how we do the same sort of thing. Right. But we're seeing that veterans are just on 10 different medications. Uh, they're in therapy for decades and they're still struggling to hang on. 
Meanwhile, financially, their family-wise, all this is deteriorating. Um, so that's the, the struggle that veterans face. They have no other option. Right. And so they come to us, and the only reason we exist is a highlight of how much there is a failure in the mental health system. We have people that are struggling to make it to the end of the week, and they're just looking for something. So fortunately, we, we're seeing psychedelics have a, a very profound impact on their life versus what they've tried before. You know, it's not uncommon. I've been in therapy 10 years. I've been in therapy 20 years. I've been on Wellbutrin. Uh, I've been on Adderall. Right. And then this was the thing that, that changed the life. Um, but that's one component of it. Yep. As Sebastian mentioned, they're coming into these situations of isolation. They're coming into these situations of lack of purpose. <clears throat> It just highlights, and I think psychedelics can also teach us, because they come from these communities, they come from this sort of tribal aspect. There's so much we can learn from that that we're just sort of, I think, with ego, not paying attention to that. We need to evolve mental health. Fantastic. Couldn't have set that up better, because that takes me very nicely to Sutton uh, in the conversation. Jesse, thank you very much for your comments. Um, introducing uh, Dr. Sutton King, uh, who's joining us here today uh, as a tireless proponent for Indigenous rights and someone who has worked to support Indigenous access to healthcare, including psychedelic therapy. Uh, Sutton, I just want to follow on to what Jesse was talking about. So, obviously, traditional knowledge in plant based medicines or psychedelic medicines is super important, uh, but we don't always care for that as a Western society. So, tell me a little bit about what we can do to make sure that we honor those people that came before us and maintain some of the traditions that Jesse was talking about. Sure. Uh, first, I'll start by saying, Koso Tokoli Sutton King, not Kao Pumiti, you got from Guahawai Ni'i, Ognata Nawadipalota, Oniota Aga Ni'i. Hello, my name is Sutton King. My Menominee name is not Kao Pumiti. I'm Afro Indigenous of the Menominee and Oneida Nations of Wisconsin. Um, as shared, I'm an indigenous rights activist and social entrepreneur, um, wearing many different hats, right? And so I'm looking at this from several different lenses, one being the co-founder and president of the Urban Indigenous Collective. Uh, it's an indigenous-led public health organization based here in so-called Manhattan, what we call Lenape Hoke, really advocating and providing access to culturally appropriate mental health resources for urban natives living in the tri-state area. We do this through community-based participatory research, programming, advocacy, and now that we have a community center here on 39th and 8th, uh, direct services. Outside of that, I'm also the program manager uh, of the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund. Uh, this is an indigenous-led philanthropic vehicle um, supporting indigenous-led conservation of ayahuasca, iboga, mushrooms, peyote, and the toad. Um, and so what we're really seeing here uh, is the alienation of indigenous peoples who have protected and stewarded these plant medicines for time immemorial. You know, we can't tell the history of psychedelics uh, without including the indigenous peoples who have protected and stewarded these medicines, right? Psychedelics didn't begin in the 60s or 70s with Huxley or Hoffman. Uh, they began with indigenous communities who have been sitting in ceremony for time immemorial. And so I think it's really important as we're seeing the psychedelic renaissance happening right now, uh, that we are including indigenous voices in the co-creation of these businesses that are being scaled, right? Um, I think we really need to look at appreciation <coughs> versus appropriation, right? And how we can appreciate and honor these communities are looking at different biodiversity protocols, looking at the free prior and informed consent um, that is an indigenous right that's highlighted in the United Nations uh, rights on indigenous peoples known as the UN DRIP, right? Um, this really speaks to really being able to consult with indigenous peoples um, before we decide to scale these therapeutics, right? Really understanding um, the plight that indigenous peoples have had to go through uh, to be able to protect these medicines. We've lost so many, you know, parts of our cultures, our ancestors. Um, you know, psychedelics were illegal. We were criminalized for them. Uh, it wasn't until the American Indian Religious Freedom Act where we actually had the right to sit in ceremony, to sit with these plant medicines. Um, and so I think that, you know, before we really are considering scaling them, really being able to consult with these communities is yep. very important. And I think, you know, another very important biodiversity protocol is really looking at the Nagoya protocol that comes from the Convention on Biological Diversity. 
Um, and this really looks at corporations who are profiting from genetic resources that come from the traditional uh, knowledge communities, really ensuring that benefit sharing and access is happening. And that can look like an, a number of ways, and it all depends on that community, that tradition, and what they're really saying, right? Um, and so I think although it's an exciting time where we're really looking at a collective healing, how do we ensure that indigenous people's rights and ways of life and sovereignty are being uplifted? Um, and I think that's the way we can start to honor those uh, plant medicines. Thank you. Fantastic, Coleman. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you, if I may. Um, we just carrying on with the concept of the traditional components and the, and the spiritual components. You're doing some work and you have some interest in bridging between the spiritual and the science. Yes. Tell me about that. Yes, so it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Carl Sagan that the notion that science and spirituality are mutually exclusive is a disservice to both. And we're finding that with psychedelics, they are able to reproduce in some patients a mystical experience. So what do I mean by mystical experience? A sense of awe and wonder of the universe and the world, a deep sense of interconnection to each other, to ourselves, to each other, to nature. And it, it begs the question that if these are reproducible, then these are likely biologically normal phenomena, right. these mystical experiences. And we can argue that the underlying like moral and ethical frameworks, a lot of our, our religions are based on the sense of interconnectedness, oneness, love, unity. And it reminds me of, of some interesting movement that this, these psychedelics can, can move into for conflict resolution, you know, to remember that it's not us and them, you know, this othering that we can do so easily. There was this uh, study of observational study done at Imperial College of London where they had given ayahuasca to Israelis and Palestinians. Right. And it was really interesting after there was such a beautiful reverence and acknowledgement to each other's culture. There was not really a desire anymore to hate each other, but to live in <clears throat> harmony and peace. And that's interesting to me. So I think the two are not... <clears throat> not distinct no, they're not distinct very good, no. very good. yeah thank you very much um, I'm gonna ask a question for to everybody in the last uh, couple minutes um, <coughs> access obviously is one of the things that we need to advocate for as you mentioned that you've both all of you have mentioned um, what successes are you very proud of that we've achieved over the last few years uh, and what's the one thing that you're really keen that we we, we follow up on. I'll start with you, Sutton, if, if you don't mind. Um, I would say the inclusion of indigenous peoples and voices. I mean, um, me being here, I'm so thankful and honored to be able to speak amongst so many respected individuals in the space. Um, but really being able to see that, you know, I've done work with biopharmaceutical companies and Journey Collab, um, who's taking synthetic mescaline through FDA to support alcohol use disorder, has created one of the first steward ownership models, um, really creating. Uh, you know, benefit sharing within the company's governance and framework. So we were able to take 10% of the founding equity um, and uh, you know, put that in an irrevocable trust to support conservation and access for BIPOC communities. Uh, with the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund, being able to raise uh, millions of dollars to support Indigenous-led conservation because the psychedelic industry understands their responsibility to ensure conservation is being you know, supported in a beautiful way while we decide to scale these therapeutics. And so I think that um, you know, this conversation about reciprocity, although I would challenge the space to use the word access and benefit sharing because mm -hmm. reciprocity assumes consent and these biocultures have not given their widespread consent, um, I, there's a lot of dialogue happening and that's exciting for me. Thank you very much. Sutton King, pleasure to have you on the panel. Thank you for Thank having you me, Michael Wayman. Jesse. Same question to you. What's the uh, some successes that you're very proud of in your work, and what challenges do we need to still address? I think just with veterans and then the the population in general that they're actually getting access to things that are healing them, overcoming <clears throat> trauma, but then also giving them a repurchase on life. So not only getting over the trauma that you mentioned yesterday, right, but also empowering their own life, uh, being happy, being content, regaining all all, all this. Stuff. It's not just a question of getting over PTSD or depression. How are you actually doing? You know, 
And so psychedelics are really providing a unique opportunity and just how much it's progressed and, and how much different communities have come together uh, is, is a pretty miraculous sort of thing. Um, for those in the audience who are kind of like new to this in terms of what needs to happen, the message we've been saying is psychedelics are, are coming. Whether you like it or not, whether right. you're uncomfortable with that or not, they are going to be a pivotal spot in mental health. But we need to make the infrastructure. We need to be prepared for that. We need to train people. We need to have these conversations to be prepared. And we tend to be very bad about that. We tend to wait for things to be absolutely inevitable before we actually enact change. And so that's really the messaging we're trying to put of like, see the writing on the wall, see that this sort of tidal wave is coming and let's work together again, whether you like it or not, of how do we make sure that this is successful and actually change the, par have a paradigm shift within mental health, which is gonna come. So now it's a question of how smooth it's gonna come. Fantastic, thank you very much. I heard an alarm going that wasn't directed at us, but I'm just, last question to you, Sarah, as well. Same question, uh, what's the one thing <coughs> you're very proud of and one thing that we have to still address? Yeah, I, I am definitely proud of some of these larger institutions like the VA allowing us to do research to help these veterans that fought for this country, but they're having to go overseas to get this care. It's just, it feels quite silly. Yeah. Um, and I'm ex you know, access to me, I, I see a medical model and then I see more of a community model as well. And the two have to be able to live in harmony together. There's many ways that we can access this both with the right to try, federal, state, and local jurisdictions, but also, as you were saying, it is so vitally important to honor that indigenous wisdom yeah. and keeping that a bit separate. So I'm excited to see those two separate worlds. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. Mm -hmm. Final question to you, slightly yep. different one for you, though. Um, just to, to reiterate what uh, Jesse mentioned about Having the treatment is fine, but if you don't have the infrastructure in the community underneath to support it, then it's not really going to work. We're we're still trying in the same system that we were uh, that we consider to be broken. Thoughts on the importance of that and that infrastructure? How do we? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I can speak to infrastructure specifically, but I would say, for example, with AA, um, I have a lot of friends who have struggled with with alcoholism. AA works because it's a, a group. Right. Um, it doesn't. You, it's very hard to get sober by yourself, and you need to be essential to someone and you need other people to support you. Um, in, um, indigenous cultures can be very pragmatic about solutions. One of the things I looked at were ceremonies conducted by some of the native tribes of, this, of the American Plains uh, to de psychologically decommission warriors after combat. Uh, very, very old rituals and uh, one was called the gourd dance. And basically it consisted of the warrior standing up and singing or dancing or retelling his exploits on the battlefield, what he did for his community. And I thought, you know, we can pick this up and drop it down in modern American society pretty easily at town halls, the, the center of civic life, of, of public life in every town or city. So I started an organization called Veterans Town Hall, vetstownhall.org. And uh, basically any veteran of any war has the right to stand up and speak for 10 minutes about what it felt like to fight for this country whether you're angry or sad or um, extremely proud or all three. Right. And the therapeutic value of this, we've been doing it for some years now, is extraordinary. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, to our entire panel. Thank you very much to our audience. Thank you. <clears throat> there's, there's a lot to come in the psychedelic space, so watch this space. But thank you very much to everybody who's working in it. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>